Um, okay. Uh, so yeah, thanks, Dimitri, for the introduction. Um, I will be talking about the classification of measurement-based quantum transmission in stabilizer tests, um, which is essentially the content of my master's thesis that I did uh, here at UBC under the supervision of Robert. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, I'll start with a figure, which is going to be kind of my uh, roadmap to this general area. Um, and so the, the question that I'm broadly looking into is how can we harness many body entanglement for uh, quantum information processing? And this is um, not a question of optimization because we already know some very useful states like the cluster state that can do this very well. Uh, but instead it's a question about classification. Um, so we're essentially looking for insights into quantum computation and the paradigm of measurement-based quantum computation lets us do that by sort of attacking the problem through resource states. And so looking at classifying entangled states by their usefulness for MBQC. And hopefully that will kind of show us what is the difference between the useful state and the not so useful state. Um, now, so the figure reflects that we can look at this at a few different levels of complexity. So on the top, we have um, sort of computational complexity. So there's two protocols you can implement. One is called quantum wire. It's kind of the simplest MBQC thing you can do. It's just about creating long range entanglement. Um, and then we have obviously full quantum computation doing some sort of unitary evolution, some sort of useful operation. Uh, and then the vertical axis here reflects the fact that you can, uh, we've known for a long time that you can do this with specific states, like resource states, but then more recently it's been discovered that you can do this throughout entire SVT phases. So this, the vertical axis is kind of about robustness. There's a few different levels of robustness that we can do with that. Um, and then in the middle, we have a couple of overarching themes that so far have proven very useful in understanding this whole phenomenology. Um, the first is quantum cellular automata, or QCA. Uh, and the second one is symmetry. And the, the symmetry bubble is bigger than the QCA bubble because QCA are, in a sense, contained within the symmetry bubble uh, because QCA are associated with certain symmetries, but not the other way around. Not all symmetries are associated with QCA. Okay, so now that we have kind of the uh, the bird's eye view, um, I'll give an outline of where I'm going to go from there. Uh, so I'll talk in more detail about those um, those protocols I was talking about, the different levels of complexity, um, and then I'll talk about how symmetric tensor networks and QCA come into this picture, and use a couple of examples to illustrate that. And then also go a little bit further to show how we're going to look at a, an entire class of entangled states, which we call stabilizer tests. Uh, and that should give us all the tools to understand the, the question, the, the specific question that I'm asking um, in my master's thesis and the, the results. And then if there's time, I'll, I'll talk about the proof. We'll see if that actually comes out. Okay, so first, uh, the setting is a cylindrical translation invariant projected entangled pair state. Um, so we have a cylinder of spin one half particles, and we're representing the state of this by a tensor network. Um, we're going to give, oops, we're going to say that the circumference of the cylinder um, to the vertical direction is n, and the depth of the cylinder is d. And spin one half to physical dimension two, and we'll we'll say that the bond dimension is also fixed at two. Um, yeah. 
And then you'll notice also that these um, so the virtual legs on the edges, we've kind of taken the convention that they stick up and become physical legs themselves. These are the sites that we're mostly going to be interested in for our quantum information processing. We'll be looking at kind of entangling this side of the cylinder with that side of the cylinder, essentially, or doing some operation on information that moves from one side of the cylinder to the other. Okay, so the first, the sort of simplest thing you can do with NDQC is called measurement-based quantum wire. And so what you do is you take every uh, site in the bulk of the cylinder, you measure it in a fixed basis, which I'll take to the X basis. And this creates, given an appropriate resource state, this will create bell type entanglements between the, the sites that are left unmeasured, the ones that are on the edges of the cylinder. And so this is, I, I say, like th th this creates long range entanglement. This is also equivalent to transmission of quantum information from one side of the cylinder to the other. You can imagine that, that if you had a bunch of bell pairs, you could just use your usual Alice and Bob uh, teleportation procedure to get information from one side of the cylinder to the other. And so depending on the resource state that you use to do this, um, the, the amount of, the number of qubits worth of entanglement you can create between the two sides of the cylinder may vary with the circumference and the depth. And so uh, sort of an important definition for the rest of this talk is what we call the transmission capacity of the resource state, um, which is just a number, an integer number C of N D, that's the number of qubits as a function of the circumference and depth. Number of qubits of entanglement, that is. Okay, so the next level of complexity up from quantum wire is quantum computation. Um, and what we need to do for quantum computation is to vary the measurement basis from site to site. So if you're allowed to do measurements in different bases at different sites, then you can do universal quantum computation with an appropriate resource state, um, such as the cluster state. And finally, at sort of the, in some way, the highest level of complexity that I'm going to consider here, um, you have this notion of a computational phase of quantum matter, which is uh, an entire phase, an FBT phase, where it's constructed around a certain resource state, um, but it has in some sense, uniform computational power. And what I mean by that is that if you use the right measurement protocol that, that may have to be adjusted on specifically where you are in the phase, every state in that phase has the same amount of usefulness for MBQC. So for instance, there's a phase called the, the cluster space built around the cluster state, and you can do universal uh, MBQC on any state in that phase. Okay, so that's that's kind of the um, the outside of the roadmap, and now I'll talk about uh, how QCA and symmetry come into the picture. And I'll do this through three examples, so three kind of well known entangled states. We have the cluster state, the GHZ state, and the toric code state. So the cluster state has, in the context of quantum wire, it has maximal transmission capacity. Um, so C of ND is N, regardless of NND. And then for quantum computation, of course, we know that it's a universal resource for NDQC. And it's also sort of the, the starting point for an SPT phase, a computational phase called the cluster phase. Now, with the GHC state, um, if you have a GHC state, you can only transmit one qubit from one side to the other of your uh, cylinder. And that means that you only have one logical qubit available for MPQC. And furthermore, you can only do Z rotations on this logical qubit. So it's much less powerful than the cluster state. And 
as far as I know, it's not part of any computational phase as well. The torque code state is a little bit better than the GHC state in terms of transmission capacity. You get n minus one qubits instead of n compared to the cluster state. Um, when you go to MBQC, you can do MBQC, but it's been shown that you can, whatever you can do with MBQC on a power code state, you can simulate efficiently on a classical computer. So that's not great. Um, and finally, we don't know how the, the correct code relates to um, computational phases if there, if you can construct one or not. Okay, so three different states and sort of three different sets of behaviors with respect to these three levels of complexity that I want to talk about in measurement based quantum information. <clears throat> And so now um, we'll talk a little bit about symmetry. So the cluster state, you can write it as this highly symmetric hex state. So you've got a translation invariant hex, right, with the, the figure there. And so the local tensor is the same everywhere and it satisfies this set of five symmetry constraints. And all of them can be written in terms of Pauli operators. So it looks like a stable edge. And if you don't believe me that this is the these are the symmetries of the that give you the cluster state. Well, you can just construct the local um, stabilizer generators on a physical link um, that give you the cluster state. And we can do the same for the GHC state. So we have another set of symmetries for the local tensor. And these give us the stabilizer generators for the GHC state. Um, for the Torah code state, uh, again, you're probably not surprised at this point that this is the case. This one, you have to um, squint a little bit. Uh, so you have to first shear the lattice so that you have a square of sites here. Um, and then, okay, that looks like a vertex or a plaquette generator. And then you have to imagine applying Hadamard gates uh, down every other column of the Torah code. And then all your vertex and plaquette generators will look the same. They'll have two X's and two Z's, um, and they'll look like this. So this is equivalent to the target code. And so the kind of the, the connecting feature in terms of symmetry of all these states is that you can write the local tensor, the symmetry constraints look like a stabilizer group. So we're calling these stabilizer tests. And basically, we're going to kind of take that as the definition of this class of symmetric tensor network states that stabilizer caps have a local tensor symmetry group that is a stabilizer. And so, formally, that looks like this you have a PEPS tensor and you have a symmetry group G with five elements. It says the more fixed is D2 to the five. Um, and then each of these elements, G, corresponds to a set of poly operators acting on each of the legs um, that could do your sort of stabilizer representation of the symmetry group. Uh, and just a brief aside to <laughs> emphasize that this is not um, this is not completely like theorists run wild. Um, creating a, a totally irrelevant class of states. Uh, these, these can be in, uh, created in a lab just as sort of a, each tensor would be a, a five qubit stabilizer state. And then you can entangle two tensors so contract them by performing a Bell measurement on the adjacent leg. Um, so that's just, I mean, we have, we're not, we haven't, I'm not making use of this anywhere, but just to point out uh, that it can be done. Uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so in your example of the torque, I'm yeah. just wondering, like, uh, I, mean, I guess you just showed the local stabilizers, but like, which code state, which code word do you have? Like, this is never this. This is the event, right? Um, so this is the event. Um, yeah, so this is the event. So I imagine that there should be some way to write down the object in terms of the little uh, symmetry. Like, like, 
Yeah, I haven't thought about writing down the, the logical operators in terms of the symmetry. So that symmetry should specify the ground state. I think. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure about the logical operators. Yeah, so we're not on a torus here. We are on a cylinder. So, um, uh, okay, so we need to uh, take this into account. Um, how many logical qubits fit in there? And uh, that will now be the question on. Okay. Just want to uh, just want to throw it in. Yeah, okay, maybe that's something you can sort out later. But the thing is um, that, well, this is the state is fully determined. So there's no room for any additional specification of the structure. Fully specified. I, I don't know what the answer is. I'm just like, maybe think it's all about Yes. Yeah, there should be some logical operator you can apply, but but yeah, as Robert said, that set of symmetries, there's no more room for other ones. Okay. Um, right. So um, I've talked about symmetry and I've defined stabilizer caps. Um, so now uh, quantum cellular automata. Um, for those who are not familiar, are just local unitary update rules um, for quantum states, or if you think Heisenberg picture for the operator algebra. Um, and so, for instance, this is the cluster state example. So, if you think of just like a single ring of the cluster state tensors um, as an MPO, then this symmetry gives you the update rule for that MPO. And so, you can see that it maps Z to X and X to XZX. So this, this is the update rule for a quantum cellular automata. And it's really easy to see that this uh, QCA creates long range entanglement because if you just concatenate it a bunch of times, you'll see that I put an X in this side and I get an X out that side and it's similar for a Z. So I, I, I recreated exactly uh, the stabilizer of a, of a bell state, but uh, separated onto the two edges of my line. So, QCA make it really easy to generate long range entanglement. And so, in this sense, it shouldn't be surprised that you get maximal transmission capacity for the cluster state. Um, and I'll just mention that the, the presence of QCA or like the ability to associate a QCA with the symmetries of the local tensor is key to the description of the cluster state in the, the phase picture. It's key to the construction of this SDT phase and the operation of. Can be to see in that, group. but that's all I'm going to say about it for the moment. Oh. So go ahead. Um, can you repeat this? How do you associate the update rule to the symmetries? How are they connected? Uh, so if you just construct a ring of the tensors, and then you, uh, same as you did for the local stabilizers, you take the the local tensor symmetry and figure out. You use pilot to figure out the symmetries of the ring. And then, so this symmetry, for instance, tells me that if I put a, a Z in on the left side, I get an X out the other side. Uh, and, and, and so, for a, yeah, in every case where the symmetries, where you do that process and you get a QCA, then that's how it works. Could you just clarify what do you mean by update? It's just Stacking the lines one next to the other one. Um, I mean that that so this is you can think of this ring as an operator acting on uh correlation space. So if I if I take the circumference of the cylinder, I say that's an n qubit Hilbert space. I have an operator operating on that space, um, and this operator is defined. Completely by the update rule that zi goes to xi at every site, and xi also has a local unitary update rule, so that this let you, you know you can 
you can write any um, any transformation in terms of that that basis. If that makes sense. So you, by update, you mean the transformation? I mean the GL, yeah, the transformation that corresponds to this MPO. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, as we saw in that example, that the clustered state symmetries correspond to a QCA, but um, the GHD symmetries do not. And uh, the way you can see that is that uh, they're not unitary. So you can see if I put in a ZZ on the left here, then it maps to the identity. Um, and so we have something. Uh, this is now we're moving outside of the QCA bubble into stuff that we don't really know how to deal with yet. And that's pretty much the question that I'm going to ask with this project is that what is there besides QCA? Because there is work on how to deal with quantum wire, quantum computation, computational phases, if the symmetries are associated with the QCA. But we want to know what happens in the general case where we have symmetries, but not a QCA. And I'm specifically kind of starting at the the most simple level that we're we're trying to get a handle on this problem. And so we're starting at the simplest level, which is quantum wire in a, a completely specified state. So we're not looking at phases and we're not looking at doing anything except creating long range time. And so the yeah, sorry, I, I should actually completely read out the question, um, which is that uh, so if we have one of these stabilizer pets, how many qubits worth? Basically, what are all the possible forms of this function C of ND, the transmission capacity? And the result is that there are exactly 13 forms of this function for all the, there are something like 2000 uh, distinct stabilizer pets. Um, but the with our classification, we can show that there are only 13 forms of this transmission capacity. And so they're shown here. Um, what you're looking at is sort of a heat map. So in the vertical direction, you have starting from here and going this way, you have the increasing circumference. And then going this way, you have increasing depth. And so class 12 corresponds to QCA. So you can see that uh, at every circumference, you have uh, transmission capacity. And uh class zero is not shown here that's the triple little class where just everything is zero everywhere there's no transition capacity um and then there are sort of 11 intermediate classes uh which have these you know behaviors that we don't know exactly how to describe yet uh, in all cases and so this is just i mean right here this is just a picture um the, the proof that this picture actually corresponds to a classification sort of splits into two parts. Okay, yeah, go ahead. What's the class one and two actually? Seems like what you're describing is the first uh, So I guess the, the colors are pretty dark. So class two is the class for the GHC state. It's one everywhere. Uh, class one is kind of has these like Bands of zero and one. Um, so, so for the proof, there are two parts. There's an analytical part and a numerical part. The analytical part is has to do with reducing the size of the problem down to a scale where we can deal with it with a computer. So the the content of the analytical part is basically to say that if we have two stabilizer tensors and their transmission capacity matches for N and D uh, less than or equal to six, 
then their transmission capacity must match for all values of NFD. So this basically reduces the problem so you only have to check a grid of uh, six by six values for NFD. Um, and if you compute all those values, then you'll, you'll get all the classes. And so that's what we did with the figure on the last slide. And uh, that shows that there are 15 classes. And that's essentially the numerical part is we just, uh, we compute the transmission capacity. It can be done for those values that are, are small enough. And so we find that there are exactly the, the 13 classes that are shown on the previous slide. Um, so this is probably, I, I'll just ask if there are any questions at this point, because the rest of what I have to say is details of the proof. Um, but I think it's probably more important to spend time on questions about the, the result or the sort of, uh, setup if there are any, otherwise I will go ahead. I have a question about the definition of symmetric steps. Yeah. In the case of the cluster phase, it's actually very easy to cancel the formulas. Yeah. But it's not true in general. Right? If you take your, your representation of A or B to the well, that's the only trivial. All of them have only one, and there's mm -hmm. no constraint. So what is that? What is the tensor? I mean, it's the same. You said, you know, for any for any choice of the function, they need to be I got a tensor. Uh, they, they have to be uh, stable object oh, so you're one. Uh, but if you had identity for every group element, then you wouldn't have G isomorphic to the Z2 to the 5. So I have to be saying you have a faithful representation, each of these functions is a faithful representation. Yeah. Then, then, okay. Um, yeah, it's good. That's yeah, okay. Well, uh, if, uh, if two uh, stable objects have the same transition capacity, it's the same in the relation between the two, some way that I can perform on it. Yeah. Um, I don't know actually. That's a good question. Um, I haven't looked at that. Uh, it would be interesting in the context, like we haven't looked at this in the context of phases yet. Um, yeah, I guess that question would be relevant there, uh, but nothing to say so far. Okay, like, uh, is it okay if I kind of yeah. follow here from the back? I mean, the, uh, sorry. <clears throat> so when the, uh, when we look at 2D cluster states, the uh, maximum transmission capacity, but so have stacked one qubit cluster. They, they will also appear in the classification. And for well, kind of a stack of GHC states. Um, yeah, so they have the same capacity, but they are very different. Sure. Yeah. No, but, but in the end, it, it, it's uh, not all points. We cannot make it. Kind of concluded for statements in any direction. At least, all we can say from examples is that they look very different to the same transition. Yeah, that's all I have. Okay, thank you. If there are no more questions about this, hi, hi, my Max, question. Uh, can you hear me now? I have slides to run through the, the entire proof of why this is true. Um, we can just see how far we get. Uh, sorry, it's not like that well, but it's very clear. And from network stuff. How did these like stay like the, so you, I think somehow a big start to say to this normal stabilizer state? Or, I mean, all the examples you gave somehow correspond to this. That's like a story called stabilizer. They would all be stable other states. I don't know if I'm trying to think if the class of I don't think the class of stabilizer tests would include 
every 2D stabilized state. I'm not sure. Um, but a stabilized effect would correspond to a stabilized state. Yeah. Because you, you just get coming out of the physical legs. Uh, like the symmetries are in some way, the virtual part of the symmetries is, is, is in some way encoding like the the entanglement structure. So what's like the advantage of the same speaking itself to fit stabilized effects to the public doing an analysis of stabilized states um, in general? Uh, because stabilizer pets have the, the nice, uh, you can just look at the local tensor. Um, so instead of having to deal with a set of stabilizer generators that may, I mean, like for cluster state, you have like a five local stabilizer generator, but in general, you could have something that's much bigger. Whereas a stabilizer pet, you just have this one single site object, the tensor and its set of symmetries, and you can infer everything from that. If that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess I will move on a little bit and say a few things, uh, whatever we have time for about the proof. Um, so we're going to measure every site in the X basis. And I'm going to assume that every, in general, the what's going to happen is we're going to get a stabilizer state for these the remaining sites on the left and right edges. Uh, in general, the the particular stabilizer state would depend on these measurement outcomes. Um, but the the measurement outcomes would only affect the relative sign of the stabilizer generators. Um, so this wouldn't actually affect the transmission capacity. And that means that in the context of quantum wire, we can just uh, forget about the measurement outcomes for us, assume that they're all plus one. So I'm just going to contract every physical leg with the plus state. And I'm going to stop drawing because they get in the way. Um, so let's use the GHD state example because the cluster state example, we already know that it's kind of optimal in some sense and optimal is boring. Uh, so what we have here is the, the stabilizer generator that you get when you measure every site in the X basis. Um, so I'm going to call these by a few names that will make more sense in a couple of slides. So G, G bar, A, and B. And so the stabilizer state, the stabilizer group for the the remaining sites on the edges is generated by these operators. And now what we want to do is kind of split our cylinder into two partitions because um, we're looking at creating entanglements between the left and the right partition. Um, and so when I do that, I can write these stabilizer generators as a tensor product of something acting on the left partition and something acting on the right partition. Um, so these ones have something acting on both partitions. Uh, and these ones have, they only act not trivially on one partition. And you can see that uh, actually these two on the left here form a virtual bell pair because you've got the, the Z here anti-commutes with the string of X's and same on the other side, the Z there anti-commutes with that string of X's. And then you have these uh, sort of centralizer elements that can meet with everything locally on their own partition. And this turns out to be actually sort of a, a general structure that applies to any bipartite stabilizer state. And so there is kind of a canonical form for bipartite stabilizer states that reveals the um, the entanglement structure across the cut. Um, and so what you have is you have a subgroup called that which I'm calling P left right uh, that consists of P virtual bell pairs. And then everything else separates into these uh, uh, elements that commute with everything on their respective partition. And so using this 
uh, canonical form, we can treat our cylinder layer by layer, and this will allow to eliminate the the depth as a variable when we are considering our um, our transmission capacity. And so what happens is you you have the canonical form for a single layer, and we repeat that many times. And so sometimes we can create an anti-commuting pair at any depth if you can kind of keep mapping yourself through these stabilizer generators. So if I start here and I have my G1, it goes to G1 on the right. And then if that's the same, if that just brings me back to G1 on the left, then I can just keep going indefinitely, right? For any depth. And that would look something like this with the GHG state. So I have Z on the right, Z on the left. I map through and then I just map, match it up with another ring and keep going as far as I would like. Um, in other cases though, when you try to sort of draw this line through multiple layers, you're gonna run into a roadblock because eventually you get to a case where something on the right matches up with something on the left and that something on the left gets mapped to the identity. So then you kind of get stuck. And what that looks like is a symmetry like this. Um, so, uh, sorry, this is a computer generated image, so it's not as pretty. And these physical legs should all be considered to be measured. So we're only looking again at the edges. So I've got something again, that starts out here, makes it partway through, but then gets stuck halfway through because it gets matched the identity. So it can't form an anti commuting pair with anything over here. And so we can't create any long range entanglement with this particular uh, stabilized generator. And so a few things to notice about this type of operator. First of all, if you get stuck, you can't become unstuck at a later depth because I can just add the identity on another layer indefinitely, and this will still be a symmetry of my uh, cylinder. And then because of the canonical form, you only have so many stabilizer generators to work with. So every one of these generators that get stuck I must subtract from the number of anti commuting pairs that you have. So the more generators that get stuck, the less your transmission capacity becomes. And so I'm not going to prove it formally, but there are a few useful results which you can at least verify for yourself by looking at the, by considering that picture and by looking at the, the heat maps here. So the first one is that as the depth increases, the transmission capacity has to either decrease or remain the same. And that's essentially related to the fact that once you're stuck, you can become unstuck. Uh, the second one is that if the transmission capacity ever stabilizes, so that if it's ever constant from one layer to the next, then it must be constant uh, all the way through for any greater depth. And so the consequence of those two is that the transmission capacity has to stabilize at depth n by the at the latest. Um, so if you have circumference n, you only really need to check up to depth n, and, and you'll know the behavior for any depth. And I have four minutes left here. Oh, okay. Uh, I might actually be able to finish this one. So, yeah, the so we have a canonical form for the stabilizer that eliminates the dependence on n. And now we want to do something, to, or sorry, eliminates the dependence on d. The now we want to do something to eliminate the dependence on n. Um, and the way we do that is that you can show that there's a another form for the generators of this bipartite stabilizer state, uh, which we call the local form. Uh, local because 
it consists of only generators which are made up of one, two, or three local operators, um, with the exception of this guy, which is like a, a string of the same operator going all the way around the ring. But everything else, like the as in the cluster state, or in this example, it has support on at most three sites. Um, and this is important because for two reasons. So the first is that um, as a consequence of this local form, the canonical form, and so the number of anti-commuting pairs, and therefore your transmission capacity, depends on whether the circumference is a multiple of two or not, or a multiple of three or not, because of the way that these intersect and interfere with each, with each other when you distribute them around a ring. Um, so that's one, one consequence of this local form. The second consequence of the local form is that you can have sort of a irregular intersection um, in the following sense, that if I have two, three local operators, like say the red one is all X's and the blue one is all Z's. If I'm on a ring of four sites, if you slide one to the very edge of the other, then it wraps around the far edge and so they commute with each other. But in general, if I go more than four sites, then the opposite end doesn't overlap and so it anti commutes for any circumference greater than four. So essentially, there's this kind of small region, n equals one, two, three, four where things don't behave as we expect. And so numerically, this means we have to check n equals one, two, three, and four. Um, we don't really have any analytical results about that. Then, okay, we're beyond that threshold of things are gonna behave now in a way that we can expect is not going to change as n goes to infinity. Um, then in that region of where everything is more regular, we need to check um, the, the previous conditions that I mentioned, mentioned. So the n divisible by two or not, and n divisible by three or not. And so the lowest values that will satisfy those requirements are just five and six. And so this brings us to all the values that we need to check for n, n equals one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and then since you can constrain n to less than n equals six, and we know we only have to go up to depth, depth n for circumference, circumference n, uh, that's kind of the end of the story. We just have to check up to six by six. So just to kind of wrap up and reiterate, we have a complete classification of these transmission behaviors in the context of quantum wire for stabilizer pets. Um, we've got 13 classes, and the only one of these classes is QCA. So we've kind of uh, taken a little bit beyond that to see what other phenomenology is out there. And the next step would be to look at the rest of the, the bird's eye view diagram that I started with and start to uh, fill in some more of the blanks there. So the next level of complexity would be to look at the quantum computation and see whether which stabilizer pets are useful as resource states for MDQC, and then go on to ask um, whether we can construct SPT phases around those fixed points, and if we can, whether those SPT phases uh, are computational phases in that uh, and if you see power is uniform for those phases. And I think that's all I have to say. Uh, I think, and I'm happy to take questions. Hey, hello. Can you hear me from the web? Oh. Yeah. You do not extend the, like, not for a wire, but for a variation. You do not extend uh, the computing power also to the formula for all I mean the like the number of qubits in the wire 
corresponds to the number of logical qubits you have available to do computations with. Yep. So if that drops, then I guess in some sense you're it depends on your definition of computational power, I guess. Right. Um, yeah. Because I mean it's perceivable for me that if you have some sort of symmetry that um, you cannot do certain things in an aspect of depth five, but you can do them in depth four and six. Um, maybe that is, yeah. So, we haven't considered computation yet. Mm -hmm. I guess it would be a question of, yeah, when did, do you consider computation kind of very fine grained and then you look at every value of n, or do you look at, well, I have a very long cylinder in that limit, can I do any computation that I want? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think we just not that Thanks. Where do you see this picture? So you have these these um, these uh, layer operators. Yeah. These define a completely positive map. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily unitary, but even it's always completely positive map. So for those things, you always de decompose the spectrum on in the, the singular values which are on the unit circle. And then those that have uh, that are inside, right? And so if you because you just repeat this map over and over again, the spectral subspace that corresponds to the small eigenvalues, you just vanish. And you just repeat the, the, the power of the eigenvalue. And the only thing that remains are those what corresponds to the eigenvalues in the circle. So it seems to me that you know this must be related to your decrees. And then, you know, in some cases, something remains for long, long, long wires. In some other cases, nothing remains. It seems to me that these two pictures should be equivalent. Now, if there's no eigenvalue in the unit circle, that, I mean, if you just want it, just one thing that remains. Yeah, if there's more than that, then more things should remain on in the long wire. Limit. So, is there, you know, have you thought about this? Does it just make any sense? Um, I mean, Qualitatively, yes. Uh, uh, like, certainly, it corresponds to the phenomenology that we're seeing. I don't know how to actually construct the unitary transfer, non-unitary transfer operator, in a way that I can work with it. So, what we were in numerically, what we work with are um, the binary symplectic representation of the Pauli group. So your Update rule is a in the unitary case is a symplectic matrix, it's a binary symplectic matrix. So, but then you go to non-unitary and mode and have a non-unitary symplectic matrix. So it's hard to construct something that works in that sense. So I'm not I'm not sure how to construct the transfer operator in a way that you could then apply that uh, the eigenvalue sequence. Yeah. You know, if, if I may add to that, um, I mean, I'm not saying it's inconsistent with what you said. So these transfer operators, they are projections you know, on, on eigenspaces of Pauli observables, followed by a unitary. Yeah, so what used to be an eigenstate of the projection after the unitary will no be no longer be an eigenstate uh, of the projection. So that in my mind complicates the picture, but you say you're looking at the whole thing and the eigenstate of that. I mean you, you're looking at this composition of projection and unitary right. and the eigenstate of that eigenstates of that thing. Yes, exactly. I'm making a spectral decomposition of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that could potentially right, be outside. Very, so you talk about the singular value, not the eigenvalues. But you still have a theory about the eigenvalues. You know that the eigenvalues are always on the unit circle and inside. And everything that is first comes to inside when you repeat it, it just disappears. Right. Now, thing, there's a question whether you can characterize it, you know, you can actually get a handle on these objects by just using the symmetry. Yeah. 
I'd love to continue in the in the break. David, do you have any questions? David, do you want to unmute yourself? Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, oh, and there's so, and there's somebody else I think in the call who had a question after, but I'll let the, but I'll but I'll go first. Um, thanks for the talk. I have a couple questions. What were they? Um, first, did you look at any other? David, we could not hear you. Did you look at natural for like the cluster? Oh, sorry. Uh, can I continue? Um, Please start over. Yeah, I, I, you cut out. As soon as you start the question. Can you, are you hearing me clearly now? Once in a while. <laughs> You're sometimes okay. clearly understandable, sometimes off. Let me just type my question and you can read it out. Would that be simpler? Michael, can you please uh, do that? Sure, we can try that, yeah. Uh, or maybe try one more time. Actually, yeah, okay. Yeah. okay, my first question was, did you consider bases of measurement other than the X basis um, and compute the channel capacity in that case? Uh, no, so I mean, the, the only requirement for quantum wires is just that you measure all on the same basis. So you can kind of pick a basis arbitrarily and adjust. Oh, right. Um, so, so we're right, of course. Pick, yeah. yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Um, and for some of your diagrams of the capacity versus N and D, they seem somewhat irregular. Did you look at them, for example, like you know, extrapolate some of those figures in some cases to larger uh, n, and see if there's like some sort of a pattern in the capacity, like you know, like maybe a fractal pattern or something? Um, no. So I can only go to about this is ten by ten. Yeah. Um, I can probably go to like ten by twenty in either direction. Um. And going going further in depth is not going to help you in this case because it's already stabilized. Going further in circumference, you see that these kind of um, like the, these strips where it behaves, like you, you kind of have strips where it's constant and a strip where it behaves. And these strips are kind of show up at certain intervals. Um, like I think this one shows up at I, I forget, there, there's some powers of two and stuff that you can kind of maybe start to see a pattern, but of course, going to 20, you don't get that many examples. So I, I can't really say anything concrete. And I haven't really seen okay. anything practical either. Cool, thanks. And one last question. Um, it, it's been recently showed that if you consider stabilizer states, which have composite dimensional Hilbert spaces, so for example, some sites have qubits and some sites would have q trips or something then the class of topological orders you can access is much, much more interesting. So you can get things like, um, like um, semion models in that case. Do you think you'd be able to generalize your model to have, well, both to have Q dits and then to have, you know, composite the dimensional Hilbert spaces? Um, I don't see a reason why not, except to note that if you start um, having qubits on like different dimensionality on different sites, then you lose the advantage of having a single local tensor symmetry because you have to have one one tensor for the qubit or whatever site and one tensor for the qubit sites, as far as I can think. Um, so that's maybe one disadvantage, but I don't see in general why you could still define like a qubit to stabilize a tensor or something like that. Right. I guess in that case, you could make your tensor, for example, have both a qubit and a qubit in a single tensor, but that might make things much more harder computationally. Yeah. If you have numerically. Like nice, yeah. If you have like a nice pattern where you could like, you know, block like a qubit and a qubit into a site that was then repeated, then you could have like one tensor for that block site uh, and do something like that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Hello, can you hear me? Oh. Please try again. 
Uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, yeah, I have a question that uh, when you introduce the concept of computational phase, you mentioned that you want to find states that is SPT, those SPT states. Uh, so I wonder whether there is a physical reason that we need to consider SPT states. Uh, am I heard? Um. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, uh, my, uh, uh, my question is, uh, why when we consider computational phases, we need to find those SPD states? Why are we considering computational phases? Uh, yeah, and we, uh, and we should find those SPD phases. Uh, why are we considering which SPD phases are uh yeah um i mean because we're so we're interested in insight into the structure of quantum computation i guess and so hopefully like we have some examples of computational phases that sort of let us hijack the tools of condensed matter physics to say something about quantum computation. And so we are hoping to continue the hijacking operation and expand it as far as we can um, to as many different examples of SPT phases as we can, and hopefully this will tell us more about uh, quantum computation. Does that make sense or have I not understood the question correctly? Oh, uh, I'm not sure whether I'm I'm clearly heard, but I am still wondering why SPT is important in quantum computations. That we should discuss it when we are talking about computational phases. Why SPT as oh as opposed to like uh, phases with intrinsic topological order or something like that. Yeah, uh, could you say it again? Uh, I did not hear very clear. Are you, are you saying why SPT as opposed to more general phases? Oh, I, I mean, why, why SPT is, is important when we are talking about computation or computational phases? Um, so I guess it kind of comes down to resource states. And so resource states are, well, you need entanglement for a resource state, but you need a very specific type of entanglement. Uh, for instance, you can have too much entanglement, like the GHC state is very entangled, but it's not very useful for quantum computation. So you need just the right amount of entanglement. And we don't know exactly the recipe. And furthermore, the um, resource states are actually extremely rare if you look kind of randomly in Hilbert space. Um, but if you add symmetry into the picture, then they become a lot less rare, as in the case of the, the cluster phase. That's a whole family of states where we add, add the symmetry that protects the phase, and suddenly we find a whole phase full of resource states. So one of the reasons we look at SPT phases is because symmetry seems to make it a lot easier to find resource states. Oh yeah, okay, I, I think I understand, thank you. Daniel, I have two questions, but I'm not sure whether we are on time. Maybe I can defer them afterwards. Is that the alarm clock outside? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think we have time for questions, sure. Okay. Um, so did I understand correctly that um, if, if at one in the beginning you were saying how how do we measure the amount of usefulness for measurement-based quantum computation? And which is which is this um, how do we measure this amount of usefulness? Which is the point is you're you're asking yes. well, yeah. so it depends on the context. Okay. You have to kind of pick a 
um, pick a task that you want to do, and then pick some metric that tells you how good you are at that task. So for instance, here, I picked the task quantifier and said, okay, the metric is the transition capacity. Okay. Yeah. And we'll have to, we're, we're still figuring out what the best metric is to characterize computational power, like, well, then you can see. Um, the other question might be, might be trivial. Uh, uh, you, the construction of the quantum cellular automata uh, brings us to this, not, not a torus uh, geometry, but this open cylinder. Um, so uh, what, what would happen if you are opening and folding this cylinder and you have this simple stripe with local mandatory conditions? Um, how how much do we need? Because I mean, this is just like very applied uh, question. If we had a bunch of, you said that we can associate every um, tensor with five indices, and we, because we are restricted to the physical dimension two and the phone dimension two, we can take five qubits. Um, would that matter? Uh, the thing that you are wrapping around. Or then I uh, efficiently do it in uh, some physical apparatus with some qubits with a certain connectivity. Yeah, so you're, you're saying like it might be easier to construct instead of a cylinder, a ladder with several with n rungs kind of thing, mm -hmm. and so open boundaries on the top and bottom. Mm -hmm. How much would that affect this construction uh, of the model construction? I don't know. My intuition is that you would be probably okay far from the edges, but you might get some non trivial edge effects mm -hmm. that might mess up the computation you were trying to do. Uh, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.